So I want to just take a, a moment uh, real quick uh, to try to do a one-up on Shmuley, who was asked to give the Devar Torah, but I will refuse to let uh, this curmudgeon of a rabbi outdo me uh, as I try to make sure it never happened when we lived together in England, uh, to really give the Devar Torah. And these two weeks are very magical uh, 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 weeks to me. Uh, Vayetze is, the, is last week, and uh, uh, me, Kat, me Cakes is this week, the two Torah portions that come together to form a very beautiful story right during Hanukkah, which is very important to me uh, for reasons which I will tell you. Um, last week's Torah portion ended with uh, a dungeon scene. After 10 years of captivity, after being betrayed by his brothers in an act of betrayal, uh, um, uh, Joseph, thrown into the well, ends up in Pharaoh's prison, had been there for 10 years, uh, 10 years, and, and he comes upon two men, a, a butler and a booker, no, a butler and a, and a, and a, and a butler, and a, sometimes I feel like I've been in prison for 10 years, <laughs> a butler and a baker, some people here know their Torah, I'm very happy about this, and this is the moment that, I, that really is important to me, this is the moment, and it is powerful what it says in the Torah, that, that Joseph sees these two men looking down and offers to help them. This one act of kindness, how powerful one act of kindness can be. Here in his own challenges, he saw two people suffering and reached out to them with one act of kindness in last week's Torah portion. Now we see in this week's Torah portion that that one act of kindness set off a chain of events, powerful chain of events. It led to interpreting two dreams of the two men that were there. It led one to return actually to his job. It led him to telling the Pharaoh about, about Joseph. It led Joseph to coming to meet the Pharaoh. It led Joseph coming to interpret the Pharaoh's dream. It led to the Pharaoh then taking action to prepare a nation for years of famine. And indeed, that one act of kindness led ultimately to that nation being saved from terrible famine and starvation. This two Torah portions really show the power of an act of kindness. Chesed, Sadaka, these core principles of the Jewish tradition that I believe in my heart are such a seminal part of the human experience. And so here it, it, it is important that this is the Torah portion during Hanukkah. Because to me, what kindness is, it is actually imparting energy. It is actually the imparting of love. It is actually the imparting of light. You see, candles are symbolic light, but the true light of humanity is our deeds and our actions that can bring about goodness. When we do one small thing, we ignite the world, just as one small flame lit in a darkened room cast away that darkness. This is our power. I say it every day, the biggest thing you can do just about any day is a small act of kindness. And when you do that small act of kindness, as Joseph shows us, it reverberates into the world. I stand here as mayor today to celebrate Hanukkah, but also to help celebrate the spirit of Hanukkah. Here in Newark, this last year, 2012, I have witnessed kindness, acts of compassion that have made me literally go home at night and, and as I'm saying my prayers and meditation and have my eyes teared up. The most recent, what I saw during sin, in this city, hit by the most devastating of storms that I could imagine, in, in, in the deepest darkness of that storm, this city was illuminated by thousands of acts of kindness. I saw it in my council people who rose to that occasion and illuminated of the dark hours. I saw it in my citizens. One of my favorite moments was I was on 18th Avenue Council in the Central Ward and we were giving out water and this woman elderly woman from the Central Room rides up in a motorized wheelchair and she says, I need two cases. And I said, ma'am, we can't give that much to one person. She goes, you don't understand. There are a lot of people on my block in need. I'm going to be delivering this water. We went and followed up and I could not believe it, seeing a woman in a motorized wheelchair.
wheelchair delivering water to some people that should have gotten up and gotten their own water themselves. <laughs> it was this profound goodness that I still see. I was giving a speech a in Los Angeles to the Federation. An elderly Jewish woman who has no connection to New York walks up to me and says, I heard about what's going on in New Jersey and forced a check into my hand. I looked down and it was a $5,000 contribution to Sandy Relief in, 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 in my hands. This is the amazing power that we have. And let me tell you what else about Newark. A lesson the city has taught me in earnest that the only kind of invincible, immutable, infinity that we can bring into this world is our light and energy. It is the same as in physics. If you look into the night sky, you see stars that are billions of light years away. And some of those stars, as I was taught, have gone out long ago, but it takes so long for their light to travel that we still see them as if they're there, and it gives testimony that even when the physical body is gone, the energy and the life and the goodness and the love that they give off goes on forever. The generations yet unborn can be touched. The council people and I know this has been a tough year of loss in Newark, New Jersey. We, we've seen some great New Yorkers go, from the great Gus Henninger to, to the incredible activists of Wesley Tan. There's been some heroes that have left us in the physical form here in Newark, but we know that the goodness and the kindness and the service that they gave will go on forever. It still lives with us now. And this brings me full circle back to the Torah portion. Because I, I left here last year running off, literally to run to catch a plane to go to Israel. And, and when I got to Israel with my parents and my father was getting ill now, it was, it was a difficult time in my family. This was last year when he still had a clarity and his mental faculties were not affected by his Parkinson's. This was his dream. On my screensaver now is my father and I on his dream vacation, his last trip overseas from a man who served overseas in the military. This was his last trip, and, and, and I had a screensaver moment of he and I praying together, hand in hand, at the hotel as my mom stood back and watched and wept. I'll never forget that night. They went to bed, and I was standing in the King David Hotel with a young friend of mine from, from New York, and, and the two Israeli former special services guys come up to me and say, we shall go for a ride. <laughs> and I said, yes, we shall. <laughs> and we jump in their, in their car, and we drive off. And before I know it, we're in the desert. And I lost cell phone reception. And I'm thinking to myself, is this what they do to the Goyim when they visit Israel? <laughs> Take them into the desert. And I get to a hill, I get suddenly I get cell phone reception back. And 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 they bring me to the hill and I look down and I see the, the valley of the city and they tell me there yonder hill on the other side of the valley is Mount Nebo. And some of you know from the Christian Bible or the Jewish Torah, you know that Mount Nebo is where Moses stood and looked over to the promised land. He knew he would never go there. But this is what he got to see. And as they told me this story, I felt chills go over me. And I asked them for two things. Pull out your Torah and pull out your iPad. <laughs> and, and, and they pulled out the Torah. I said, read the Torah portion. I pointed to what I wanted them to read. And they read a segment of the Torah. And I'll tell you what that is in a second. But then I said, give me your iPad. And I pulled up a speech that we all know, Jew, Christian, Muslim, all of us in this room, the last speech of Martin Luther King, who said he had been to the mountaintop, and he had looked over, and he had seen the promised land. And though he would not get there with you, his eyes had seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Hours later, King would be shot and killed at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. And at that hotel today, if we went and went to the spot 
the king was slain, there would be a black man that would have words from that Torah portion about Joseph. And the words there simply read, Behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what will become of his dreams. Well, they did slay him, but the light of that king still lives forever. The light of that dream, of the goodness, of the kindness, of the sacrifice, of the service goes on and lives on and inspires us still today. That is the light of Hanukkah. That is the light of humanity. That is the power we all have. And what God calls for us in the example of those Jews who tried so hard and prayed so hard for that Hanukkah miracle, what God calls for every one of us, Christian and Jew and Muslim and Baha'i and Sikh, what he calls for all of us is to be light, to be brilliant, to let us shine so brightly in this dark world that we cast away shadows and that generations yet unborn even after we are gone, can feel our warmth. And so this is the story of Hanukkah. This is the story of humanity. This is the story of work. We've been through some mighty tough times. But the light of our people in this city is indeed a Hanukkah miracle. The light of the people in this city casting away darkness of doubters and cynics and other places who never believed we could shine so bright. The light of the people in this city and the light of the kindness we experience today will go on forever. To all of you here, I say something to say. Yashar Kohl. Thank you. Let's give the mayor another round of applause for the remarkable Mark Cohen. Thank you.